a very good evening and a warm welcome to Buddhist Mahavihara's Facebook page. Uh, tonight, joining us in the Dhamma Dhana series, we have uh, on live Venerable Dr. Chandana Thero, and he's he will be talking about the Rohitasa Sutta, and he will be uh, joining us from Buddhist Mahavihara, via, where he's carrying out a retreat at the moment. And there will be participants from there joining us as well. So I will introduce Bhante to the screen now. Good evening, Bhante. Good evening. So uh, before we proceed, I will share Bhante's profile for those of who are new here and who are unfamiliar with Bhante's work. So uh, Bhikkhu Chandana is a Theravada Buddhist monk who has been a student of the Dhamma for over 30 years and having sat at the feet of many learned Mahatheras and has been the teaching medication for over two decades. Academically, in addition to his master's in psychology, Bhante Chandana has a doctorate in Buddhist ministry and has received the title of teacher of Dhamma in 1998, uh, which was given to him by late Venerable Hevanapola Ratanasaru Nayaka Mahatero. And uh, to begin his uh, Dhamma teaching in 1990s. Uh, currently, Bhante lives and teaches in the USA as well. And he has been retranslating and then narrating the Pali Sutras for YouTube to safeguard the teachings for prosperity as well as giving Dhamma talks while conducting meditation retreats online and around the world. Bhikkhu Chandana is a licensed marriage and family therapist serving as a psycho psychotherapist for low-income individuals and their family. Uh, Venerable Dr. Chandana's book, A Manual on Buddhist Meditation and Lifestyle, A Return to the Source, has been published by the Buddhist Mahavihara and is available for free distribution. Uh, it is, has been now translated into Italian and Spanish as well as currently being translated into Chinese, Armenian, Russian, Portuguese, and Sinhala. And uh, I would like to take this moment to share with you that uh, Bhante Chandana will be moving to Europe and will continue his Dhamma work, much like that he has done in the past four months uh, in Buddhist Mahavihara. Uh, he is giving retreats and continuing his ongoing retranslation of the Pali Suttas and the audio recordings of the suttas, which are, is freely available for any listeners around the world. Uh, so Bhante appreciates all financial support because uh, he does not have the support of any local monasteries. So for that, I would like to share uh, Bhante's email address, as well as uh, you can make any donations to Bhante through his PayPal account. So now I would hand over to Bhante to start today's Dhamma session. Thank you, Diani. Um, before we begin, let's pay homage. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato salva sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato salva sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa buddhan saranam gacchami dhamman saranam gacchami sangham saranam gacchami uh, Today is... Uh, I haven't been on StreamYard for a while, but uh, I'm going to try my best to remember how to work it. So. Um, as uh, Udiani mentioned, um, I have been staying at the uh, Buddhist Mahavihara in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, and for the last four months. And uh, today uh, we are still on retreat, so uh, there are participants from Malaysia and uh, other places from around the world participating. So uh, I, I will be addressing both the listeners on a virtual sense as well as in a personal face-to-face -face environment, which is the case here at the BMV. So um, 
without further ado, I'd like to just go ahead and, and just jump in to the theme of uh, today's uh, uh, talk, which uh, I have chosen on the uh, um, one of the suttas, which has a very interesting connotation. It's 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 deep, but it seems um, rather simple. It's deep if we know how to listen, as all the suttas are. It is about the world. A question is raised to Lord Buddha, and uh, not just by anyone, but by a deva, and not just by any kind of deva, but a deva who had very superlative abilities, even as a layman, as a human being in the past. And the question is about the world. The question is about what is the world? And is there a way that one can reach the end of the world? Because he tried in his past life and he died trying and he could not reach it. So he's curious. Now as a deva, he's come, presented himself in front of Lord Buddha to ask if anyone can know the answer to that question. It's got to be Lord Buddha. So there's an interesting dialogue. But when we speak about the world, we often speak about the world or existence. Loka, the world is the word is loka, but loka could also mean existence, could be universe. But do we know what it is? The world. Is it the planets, the earth, stars, galaxies? Is it the oceans, the clouds, fields, mountains, and all their inhabitants, occupants? Is it, is it therefore the planet's inhabitants, us, people, the food we eat, the politics? Are these the world? Is this, are they the parts that comprise the world? These, of course, are parts of what we call the world. Yes, but we need to widen our understanding of the world as we study the Dhamma. In the Majjhima Nikaya, Sutta number, I think it was 49, the coming and going of beings, Lord Buddha says, is the world. Coming and going. We can also understand, if we're studying the Dhamma, that the world of the Asavas is the world. The Sankharas are the world. The six sense doors, the craving that we develop through them. From where suffering comes into the scene, those all combined make up the world. So it's not just world as in a planet, planet Earth, the world. That's very infantile. That's very, very banal, very mundane, very superficial way of understanding the world as far as the Dhamma is concerned. The lack in understanding, not having right view, and what's even worse, when we don't know and see that we have wrong view, while we think that we do have right view, that itself is the world. Because that's, that's pretty bad. When a person not only does not know, but thinks that they know, there's no way that they will admit that they do not know. So, I would like you to approach the world that we're going to be going over, the, the meaning of quote-unquote world, loka, in a wider sense, not in certain dimensions, mathematical dimensions. So uh, with that intro, I'll just jump right in. So this is the, as Udiyani mentioned, uh, the Rohitas. In fact, the Pali term for it is Patama Rohitasa Sutta. Patam means uh, part one, 
because it has two other parts following. Because Lord Buddha, the following day, is recounting it to the bhikkhus. And then another sutta follows that as there's another recitation of that. So, um, so this is uh, from the Anguttara Nikaya, which are the num numerical discourses, uh, Book of the Fours. So it's the 45th sutta. So Anguttara Nikaya 4.45. Patama Rohitasa Sutta. To Rohitasa, son of the gods, part one. So here we begin. At one time, the Blessed One was living in the monastery offered by Anathapindika in Jeta's grove at Savati. When the night was far spent, Rohitasa, the son of the gods, while illuminated the entire Jeta's grove with a dazzling light, approached the Blessed One. And after paying obeisance to him, stood to one side and said, Bhante, is it possible to reach the end of the world by traveling and to come to see or achieve that state whereby one can no longer be born, grow old and decay, no longer be subject to death, a place where there is no more dying and no more rebirth? From the question you know, the caliber of Rohitasa, He's not just any kind of a deva, because many devas, just like humans, don't have the necessary understanding. They don't have right view. Many of them, when they are reborn, reappear in a heavenly realm. Because of the glory and the joy and the bliss and all that, it's overwhelming on their senses. And they see also worlds come and go, if this, especially if they are in the Brahma realms. So they will fall victim to the wrong view, avidya, in fact, ignorance, that they are immortal. They will start thinking that they are immortal instead of very mortal, just like us, except that the time factor is a lot longer for them. So Rohitasa, despite the fact that he is a deva now, he knows that he is subject to death from his question. Is there such a world, he says, where death, dying, or birth don't occur anymore? The person has surpassed that, overcome that. So this is an intelligent deva. And this is Lord Buddha's response. Friend, I declare that it is impossible to reach the end of the world by traveling and to come to see or achieve that state whereby one can no longer be born, grow old and decay and no longer be subject to death, a place where there is no more dying and no more rebirth. Basically, you're stuck. Don't look for it, he's saying, for such a place. Avidya is the world, you know. Ignorance is the world. The belief in protecting our views is the world. Our concepts of how things are supposed to be. Feelings are the world. The feelings you have. Feelings are the world. We often neglect to consider how feelings play such an important place in understanding the three characteristics of existence. We know them by heart. Anicca dukkha anatta, you can even say it, sing it. But do you know them? Really, feel them, really. We just know it. It's like as lifeless as your name to you, for you. You'll know when someone points it out. Yes, yes, it's me. Oh, yes. Yes, teacher. But it's lifeless until someone ignites it with life by giving attention to it. And now you are selected among the crowd. But the feelings are always doing that. Avidja is there, however. The characteristics of existence are always happening, but we are not there to bother to look at them. So we use the intellect, 
cognitive abilities to understand intellectually what anicca, dukkha, and anatta are. They definitely are not intellectual conclusions. Ultimately, they are to be felt, experienced, acknowledged, understood, seen. Yesterday, I think it was, we were talking about jnana dasana. Jnana, knowing. Dasana is seeing. We have to see. We have to know. We have to understand. We have to understand. And this is Rohitasa's response to Lord Buddha's. Bhante, it is both wonderful and amazing how these true words of the Blessed One are stated. Friend, and so he repeats Lord Buddha's response. Friend, I declare that one cannot reach the end of the world by traveling, and to come to see or achieve that state whereby one can no longer be born, grow old and decay, and no longer be subject to death, a place where there is no more dying and no more rebirth. And this is where he starts telling us about his past, Rohitasa. Before this, we don't know. We know he's a deva. That's it. Here he's going to tell us a little bit about himself. Bhante, in the past, I was born as the son of Bhoja, and my name was Rohitasa. In possessing psychic powers, I would travel through the skies. That is not legend. The, these things do exist, but they're not going to be on CNN, okay? People are not going to display them. Uh, people have abilities. People have worked on these abilities. And if they're smart, they're going to keep it in hiding. Otherwise, everybody's going to just be huddling around them, and it's just chaos. It's going to ruin their lives. It's almost similar to finding a rare species of an animal that people have talked about. Orangutans are examples. Gorillas are another example. People knew, locals knew what these animals were, but the Westerners, scientists, did not know about 200 years ago. So these were just legends. Some people had seen them until Europeans, scientists, zoologists showed up. And you cannot just say, go back to the zookeepers or to society in the other parts of the world and just tell them, you need to have specimens. What does that mean? You kill them. You take samples, you take a few of them hostage. People are not ready sometimes to see these things, these abilities. But let's not think, because in our uh, uh, media mediocre world that we're living in, superficial world. We judge by what we see and we can weigh and we can measure, we can count. These things seem so like impossible. So they're like fairy tale, they're myths. So he continues. So you should travel through the skies. Bhante, I was faster in speed than the flight of a straight arrow. Shot, straight arrow, shot from a powerful bow in the hands of a strong and dexterous archer as it traveled the distance of a palm tree's shadow. A palm tree has a shadow. It could be 60 feet. The tree might be 60 feet, so it's going to be, depending on what time of day, it might be a lot longer than that. So he says he would travel the distance of a palm tree's shadow end to end as I reached the target before it did, the arrow. So he would get from one end of the shadow as the arrow is being shot to the end of the shadow before the arrow reached it. That's how fast. So he's giving us, this was actually an interesting thing for me to translate because I really had to scratch my head because when you're reading the Pali, it's really almost, uh, it's, it's very hard to decipher. So you have to pull yourself out because the other translations I saw, except for years, uh, a year later with Bhante Nyanananda's, 
he got it right, but I had already translated it. But unfortunately, what people do with translations, they take things, the word, and the word, the other word, the other word, the root words, this and that, they use grammar, gerunds and all that, and then they come up with their translation as best as they can. But a lot of the contextual and things that we take it for granted in the real world, there's so much that you cannot put into words. Now, add to that the variable or factor of time and cultures and different languages. So all of a sudden you're dealing with something that miraculously survived all these centuries and now we're trying to decipher it. So, so that, that's the image that I wanted to give you background of that. So end to end, he would reach the end of the tree's shadow before the arrow. So he's very fast. Bante, my leaping stride, the way he would jump, was such that I could put one foot on the Eastern Ocean and land the other on the Western Ocean. Meaning he's not, not at the same time. So he would just be like, doop, doop. that's how fast he would be going. And if you've uh, studied or learned or researched or just be, been interested in quantum mechanics, quantum theory, uh, entanglement, theory of entanglement principles, you will get the same uh, electron behave in a different, uh, in, in a different part of the universe, basically. They did it in a lab uh, through slits. And they were stunned to realize that the behavior of one particle was mimicking the behavior of another, despite the fact that they were in two different areas. Speed, we're talking about speed. So the thought does not, is not like light speed. Your thought is faster than light speed. It's instantaneous. It doesn't matter which part of the universe it is or the world. That's why when you're practicing metta, you being in the metta retreat, when you think of someone and your metta is strong, they feel it. You don't have to check on them, though. They feel it. It's the immediacy of it. That's how powerful it is. It's beyond time and space. That's what I'm trying to say. So his speed was pretty close to that. That's what he's saying. In possessing such speed and that stride, the desire arose to me, in me. I want to reach the end of the world. So I traveled for a hundred years. The entire duration of my lifespan. I stopped only to eat, drink, taste, and enjoy. I would rest, urinate, and defecate, go to the bathroom, as I also rested to overcome my sleepiness and exhaustion. But even though my lifespan expired, I still did not reach the end of the world a hundred years later. So I died on the way. People go on writing books on the Dhamma without experiencing it. Or worse yet, while having wrong views. They go on searching and searching and searching, imagining, manyana, imagining. Much like Rohitasta did. Flying fast through the cosmos. Imagine if Elon Musk had this power. Just go into Mars, just like that. Something that he's been dreaming about, he says. But we're always constructing webs of ideas that we often and usually always get stuck in. You know, a web, spider web, the reason why insects get caught in it because it's also sticky. Our own ideas are sticky. They grab hold of us. We become trapped in our own ideas. It's like the spider getting caught in its own web. 
Normally, you would never see that in nature, a spider getting caught in its own web. But we do. Our perceptions, our papanchas, our ideas of how the world is supposed to be. Because that's how I'm thinking. Manyana, imagining. Because we're lost in the thick jungles of papanchas. So we ignore again and again and, 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 and to basically to pause and look at, at what's happening through the six sense doors, what feelings I'm having. We don't have the speed of Rohita's arrow. We don't. That's why it's so hard for you, for meditators, for anyone actually, to be able to pick or pluck that moment when you are truly feeling something and really see what it is. Is this painful? Is this pleasant? Or is this neutral? It's happening all the time. Sati is so weak. In fact, it's like the arrow that's still in the in the in the in the scabbard or in the in the thing where you put the arrows. Storage. Collecting dust. Collecting dust. We don't look at the texture of feelings that we're experiencing. We're too busy. Come on, come on, let's go, let's go, let's go. Go where? Go where? It's always the becoming. It's always the becoming. It's the next, next thing, next thing, next thing, next thing. Because the six sense doors are so untrained, we are untrained in them, that we never look at them, each of them, as opportunities to penetrate, to understand and to see feelings as they occur. Because they are there to reveal so much to us. So we don't appreciate feelings. Meanwhile, the whole world functions on feelings. Another word for the world is feelings. And the superficial or manifested form of feelings are the emotions, and there's hundreds of them. The whole world functions on emotions. Yesterday I was mentioning to you how the whole economic system in the world is based on emotions. Getting you to be afraid to buy that mask. Getting you excited about buying that red car. Or buying that, those items of clothing. Because if you don't, it's terrible. What are your friends going to say? If your hair is turning gray, if you don't dye your hair, what are your friends going to say? See? So they come after your emotions, which are essentially, deep down, we're talking about the feelings, three types of feelings. Two of which are the only ones that get to be noticed. Painful ones and pleasant. We never pay attention to the neutrals which are the predominant feelings. So some even look down upon metta. Oh, it's just feeling-based meditation. Its ability to show us the Dhamma is overlooked. Because metta itself reveals to us yatabhutang pajanati. To be able to see how things come to be. See. See and know, jnana dasana. But looking at the world is easy. I mean, you have eyes, you have ears. It's so easy to be mesmerized. And make a story about it. I hate that person. I love this person. And then that fight, tug of war. And now you find that loved one. And now what? They say, yes, we love you too. I love you too. And next what? You are together. And next, very close, is what? What is going with you? Like a shadow. The fear that you might lose that person. Tug of war again. Again. But Rohitasa, uh, realizing that Lord Buddha pointed out that it is impossible, he says, Bhante, it is wonderful and amazing to hear the true words of the Blessed One. Friend, I declare that one cannot reach uh, the end of the world by traveling and to come to see or achieve that state whereby one can no longer be born, rolled and decay, and no longer be subject to death. 
a place where there is no more dying and no more rebirth. And the Blessed One added. So he pointed out that there isn't a way out. He's about to say, to express such a profound teaching, it changes everything. It flips the whole table upside down as to what a person might have felt from that statement. Because Rohitasa might have felt hopeless at this point. Even as a deva, I can't reach the end of the world. That's true. But that's kind of depressing that the end of death, the end of birth is not to be achieved. It's depressing. Because ultimately, what did Lord Buddha teach? The end of samsara. That's what he taught. He says, indeed, friend, I declare that one cannot reach the end of the world by traveling and to come to see or achieve that state whereby one can no longer be born, grow old and decay, and no longer be subject to death, a place where there is no more dying and no more rebirth. Yet, friend, this is the kicker. This is the sweetest part of the sutta. I say that without having reached the end of the world, one cannot put an end to suffering. So if you're very intellectual, very Aristotelian in your thinking, you're going to be scratching your head now. Isn't he contradicting himself? Because he said, it is, he's now saying, but you cannot reach the end of the world until... You know, uh, 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 one cannot put an end to suffering. But how? Look at the words, put an end to suffering. That's the key he's giving you. What is the key pointing at? First noble truth. That's the key. He is teaching Rohitasa. And when Lord Buddha starts teaching the Four Noble Truths to any listener, no one thing that that person is going to become a Sotapanna at the very least. Because this is a teaching that is unique to only Buddhas. And Lord Buddha didn't start talking about Dana, he didn't ta start talking about Sila, he didn't talk about, you know, Buddha Nusati or any of those things or the Devas. He just jumped straight to the Four Noble Truths. So we have to pay attention to these things. There's just so many like jewels here. The essence of Dhamma is here. It's a statement that is very profound. And then he continues. For it is in this perceptive and conscious fathom long body that is found the world. If you want to look for the lab, the secret tools, the secret passwords to attain Nibbana, basically, it's in this fathom long body. You want to achieve the goal of happiness? It's in this body. If you want to release yourself from suffering once and for all, it's in this fathom long body. The origin and cause of the world so he's, what is, what is he saying now? The origin and cause of the world. So he first equated the world with suffering. So now I want you to think about the world as suffering. It's a synonym. So the origin of the world or suffering, he's talking about the second noble truth. And now he's going to also say, the ending of the world, Niroda, third noble truth, and then the path leading to the ending of the world is to be found in this fathom long body. So don't go looking for it somewhere else. In uh, other suttas, well, one in particular, when Lord Buddha talks about the radiances, uh, brilliances, he says, there's four kinds of brilliances. Luminance. 
he says the sun, the moon, fire, and wisdom. And the one that dominates all is wisdom. That is what's necessary. Wisdom is not knowledge. It's not knowledge. It's not data that you collect. It's not information that you pack in your head. You squeeze, you squeeze, you squeeze. It's not that. That's knowledge. It's just junk, ultimately. If you don't apply knowledge in turning it to do the alchemical work, to do the alchemy of changing knowledge that you gain, maybe someone was generous to give you some teachings, you must transform those into livable, experiential wisdom. And wisdom is always, always experiential. So it's like that juicy, organic, sweet, healthy, unblemished peach or lemon that you know what it tastes like. Yet another person might worship the name lemon. They say, no, that's not lemon. You're actually talking about lime. They missed the whole boat. They just missed it. They don't understand the experiential part of the whole thing. So we are word worshippers, idea worshippers, manyanas. That's where papanchas come from. We worship our papanchas and take them to be reality. Hence, avijja. Uh, we need to understand how in the world, despite being in the world, when you apply action on the knowledge that you gained, that turns into wisdom. But you need to understand that wisdom works very closely to the heart, with the heart. They go hand in hand. They go hand in hand. That's why you will never get wise by going to a university. Ever. You will gain knowledge. You might have had experiences outside the classroom, perhaps, that can trigger something experientially in you, based on what you ex experienced, and you take it to the next level. But that's all you. A brick and mortar or in this case, even virtual universities that we have, they will never make you wise. Even studying Dhamma is not going to make you wise. It's going to fill up your head with a lot of information. It's not the same as wisdom. Wisdom works closely with the heart. Never without it. Never. Never. And it is only through wisdom that the world's end could be reached. That's what we hear Lord Buddha saying. Only through wisdom. You have to use the ability of wisdom, just like a laser, to cut through, to cut through the thick, thick steel metal of ignorance that you've been dragging behind in your head for eons. So, after the words of Lord Buddha, we have in this sutta, we have the ver in, a, in a poetic verse. It's, it's kind of like putting it in a nice package. Especially when these suttas are being recited. In Pali, they're much flowing, much better flowing than English. So I try to put it in as best a way as I can. So he's now summarizing it in a verse method. By traveling across the world, the end of the world can never be reached. Neither can there be release from suffering without first coming to the end of the world. By living the holy life, 
the wise knower of the worlds, reached the end of the world, and having gone to the world's end, is now at peace, no longer desiring for this or any other world. These were the words of Rohitas that we see. Sad, sad, sad. Our relationship to the world, to experience itself, is the world. Our experience is the world. The relationships we have with the world. So the world, I wouldn't like you to think about it being like just planet, continent. Some of us think like that, simplistically. You might even include your loved ones in there. Fine, your dog, your cat, whatever. That's not the world, ultimately. It's far deeper than that. Finding our way through the deceptions of the mind, the mirage of the mind, of sannyas, all these are the world. All these. Elsewhere in the uh, Lokanta Gamana Sutta, we see Venerable Ananda describing the world as that which we perceive, that we conceive, we conceptualize. Whatever we see, we immediately put it in a Rolodex, right? I don't know if they, they still use Rolodexes, but basically we put it in a nice folder in a computer, basically. We label it. And that is translated by us as the experience itself. Now we can recall Bahya Sutta, where Lord Buddha told Bahya, instructed by Bahya, when seeing, just see. There's just a seeing without your involvement. Leave yourself out of it. Don't label it. That's why I instruct you guys to not label anything. You don't need to label anything because that is actually disengaging you, divorcing you from the real experience that is taking place right now because you distanced yourself from it. Now there's an it and a you, subject and an object, thanks to you labeling with your ideas. Ah, this must be the links of the Paticca Samuppan. Yes, you distanced yourself. You must know the links, of course. You must understand them intellectually. Yes, that's not being undermined. But that is a tiny, 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 tiniest piece of the puzzle. The rest, the big chunk of it, is you having the eyes and the sati to follow it, to see it, while it's happening, like the era of Rohitasa. In fact, he was faster than the arrow, he was saying, showing off to Lord Buddha. Oh, it was faster than the arrow. So what we get from the six sense doors, that's the world. The eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and especially the big one, the mind. The mind which is the one that churns all the other five. It's the one, it's the manufacturer of all the chaos. Because the eyes cannot keep a folder. They don't have a Rolodex. They don't have anything to copy with. The eyes just see, the ears just hear. That's what their job is. The body just registers, okay, you're touching and I'm feeling, that's it, and the end of the story. Oh, yep, yep, you're still touching, okay. You let go, oh, you're not touching. Done, finished. The mind, however, says, ah, oh, the touch felt like this. The gaze, the animal, the bird, the memory of how the touch was, now it's not there. What am I going to do? All the minds work, always. Remember yesterday in the Sabbasava Sutta, how will I be? What will I be? What was I in the past? What will I be? Where did I come from? Who's doing that? The mind. The mind, papancha maker. <laughs> because it likes to keep 
tabs on things, the mind, labels things. It's very OCD in essence, basically, if you think about it. Everyone is OCD. The mind is OCD itself. Obsessive compulsive disorder. It has that. So, well, I need to label. I need to let me distance myself from that. Let me take notes. Let me take notes. Let me take notes when you're missing the whole point. You're not experiencing it. It is the mind. The one that puts the stamp of craving on experience itself. It's the mind. Mind is the one. It's the one that puts the big stamp of craving, tanha, on everything, even if it doesn't like it. That's also craving, you know. If you don't like something, that means you like something else, hence craving. So you are in a tug of war, ding, 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 going back and forth in the pendulums, swing. deceptions of sanya through and through you want to reach the end of the world eliminate sanyas but you cannot eliminate them because it's a pattern it's a habit for that you need to go deeper you need to go deeper with sati sati is the thing which is going to put the spotlight on it Someone was asking me the other day about sati, and I gave the, I had the example of when you travel in the dark, especially in, a, in a, an area, land, countryside, somewhere where there is, you, you don't know the roads, plus there are no light posts, nothing, no moon, no stars, but you have the headlights of the car. That's sati. Turn on your headlights. That's why I insist sati, 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 sati. Otherwise, you're driving in the dark. You're definitely going to slam into some things. And you've been slamming from one rebirth to the next. This, you know, filling up each birth with relationships, with I like you, I don't like you, I love this, I don't love this. All that, you know, as they say, all that jazz meaningless pointless because they stay meaningless because you're not applying wisdom to understand what's happening and you reach the end of life your eyes are now craving you look at your hands it's all wrinkled and you can see bones and veins it's like ah i wasn't like this may i occupy a body that was also again like a child let me have a new life you might not think about these things, but just the craving for something opposite of that wrinkly old skeleton-like hand. You want to leave this body. Well, you leave this body to go where? Into another body. It's the craving. You don't even have to be thinking about, oh, I need to occupy. The craving itself, which comes complements of the ignorant mind. The car without headlights. So the mind is the factory of intentions, chetana, of sannyas, ideas, perceptions, sankharas. So to, to reach the end of the world, we must become disenchanted with the world's greatest magician, the mind. The mind. The ignorant mind. The ignorant mind that doesn't allow us to see the conditionality of the six senses. It doesn't allow us to see feelings as just feelings. Not my feeling. Just feelings, the conditionality of the feelings. I was fine until you stepped on my toes. Suddenly there was this incredible pain. What pain? It doesn't say, you hurt me. That's the addition. There was pain. Why did you involve the me into this? Me, you, subject, object. I felt pain. That is the bottom line. Yes, there's pain. Just stop it there. Observe it. See it. That's understanding its conditionality. To reach the ending of the world, we need to understand the mind. We need to see the mind. 
and how it interprets and smudges and paints over our experiences of the world. So I will uh, stop here and uh, um, Udiani, before I uh, go to you, um, I have one question here from the students that I'd like to respond to. I'll read it out loud so the rest yeah. of you uh, like it so you can hear it. Bante, between equanimity and indifference, there is a very fine line. Can you graciously give us, uh, give up, uh, give us some insights to comprehend it? Actually, the line is so wide, it's not thin. But it is very much reflective of the mind perceiving it. They have a relationship. How we see the world, how we interpret the world, how we interpret experiences, has everything to do with our level of wisdom. Same thing. Even the words. There is a fine line. And it's just a term that we legitimately use in the English language. And guess what? This is a very uh, factual statement that I personally have heard from so many people. So many people think of equanimity as indifference. So what's the difference? There's a fine line. Because you're saying that there's equanimity and it's a it's a one of the Brahma Viharas. In fact, it's one of the sublime Brahma Viharas, the very last. Mm, okay. But indifference. It feels like it. No, it doesn't. Did you notice the word feel I used? People will see things that are observable on the outside. They really, even if they try, they will not be able to experience what is being felt like. So on the outside, you might have come and stepped on my foot and it might have been extremely painful and i would say ouch and then after my cringing stops i will ask you how was your wife for an observer a third person looking at this whole scenario they'll say that is not human that is he must have some neural network dysfunction. There's a shortage. Something is, is, is not working well. He must be indifferent. No. It's not indifference. But it looked like it because the person's vocabulary, emotional vocabulary, does not include upekka. And that's what we have. Earlier I was saying about individuals who write books and books and libraries of books on Upekka, but have no clue what it is. Really, experiencing it is a different story. They have commentaries, sub-commentaries to reach into, to tap into, but that's it. That's it. But that will never qualify as a genuine experience of Upekka. I've given the example uh, earlier of, uh, I used to go to my uh, aunt's house or grandma's house, I can't remember, but actually each one of their homes had this for some reason in the 70s growing up. You would, uh, you know, we didn't have a car, so you would have to walk a lot. So you would get to your relative's home and you go to their uh, living room. And in the living room, the dining table, you look up and you see a bowl, which is supposed to be a fruit bowl. And I would look at the fruit bowl and I'm thinking, wow, that's a big apple. I've never seen such an apple that size or pear or something. And being a child, when they were not looking, I would try to reach over to get hold of one of the grapes that is hanging or to touch to see if I can grab hold of the apple. To my surprise and amazement, guess what? The thing would fall. And it's like, that's not according to the laws of physics, as much as I know, because an apple is supposed to be so much heavier. And then I would take them in my hand and touch, and I see that it is plastic. It looks nice. 
So it's the same thing. Looking at Upeka from the outside window, you won't see it. You will see what is very, that comes natural to the ignorant mind, to the mind that is not accustomed to Upeka. And that's one of the reasons why I insist on people practicing the Brahma Viharas intensely, not like a five minute thing at the end of a retreat. No, that's, that's an insult. Because you have a lot of talking heads, a lot of people with this, papanchas, imaginings, manyana going on constantly. They can quote you sutta after sutta, they can bring down, take apart the Paticca Samupada, tell you who wrote what. But where's the experience of any of these truths? They're truths, you know, truth. Plural that truths, each of these experiences, biting into that juicy, organic, ripe peach is a truth that the experiencer knows. Meanwhile, someone else looking at it says, ah, oh, that's a peach. They ruined it, basically. That's why talking pictures, when they first came out, what is talking pictures? Images, television, movies. I used to do cell animation, you know, to draw and then draw and then draw and then draw. You can make about 24 of these and you can flip through them. And in one second, 24 frames will flow. That's why your eyes will not catch it as a drawing. Eventually, they will see it as a movement. And now you will connect with it in form of a relationship. You will develop relationship with this character called Mickey Mouse or Pluto or some character. None of them exists. So for these people, Upekka is one of those. Unless the person has experienced it. So the positive side of that response would be, uh, the more positive I would say, of that would be to have the individual truly experience what it feels like. To connect with themselves. Most people today, despite our, all our abilities, possessions, uh, academic credentials, you know, all those things, we are in poverty when it comes to feeling ourselves, feeling how it feels to be you, usually in the form of, do you deserve forgiveness? Every single student I've ever tried to assist, has had a problem with giving themselves metta. Each one of you has a different ways of coming up with defenses. That's, that's okay, because no one, you know, we never had, not, I don't know of anyone who's had a normal, well, healthy childhood, let's say. Healthy that's going deep into seeing yourself as deserving of metta, as able to give metta, because that's the other facet that not many people talk about. To give metta, to share metta, to radiate metta to someone else. That is like, yeah, I was able to give myself metta because I, I, can, I can swallow that. But to give metta? Oh, I don't think I'm even qualified to, Bhante. And then you can come up with excuses. Oh, I don't have a spiritual friend. Can it be my monkey? Can it be my dog? Can it be my dead cousin? Or No. Someone who's alive, a human being, that you can, you've had some relationship with. So, I hope that addresses some of your questions. Uh, Udiani, uh, if there are any questions that the audience... No, we don't have any questions from online. Uh, do any of the participants have any other questions? Um, any other questions? <laughs> I'm looking at Karen. <laughs> uh, so, yes, uh, it might be a short night, which is good, but uh, yes. So the Rohita Sutta, I recommend if you can read B 
the other two sutras as well, they're quite excellent. Uh, they're, they're, they complement each other. And um, because whatever was missed uh, can, in fact, be hopefully recaptured uh, while you're going over the second sutta, especially when Lord Buddha is giving the discourse to the bhikkhus about what happened. And you have several, several suttas where Lord Buddha, on the following day, he calls the bhikkhus over and he says, Last night, bhikkhus, a certain deva approached me and they asked this question. And he would say the responses and what the interaction was. And sometimes that generates a discussion among the bhikkhus. Like in the case of uh, Venerable Sariputta, has happened a few times, where Lord Buddha turns to Venerable Sariputta, or Venerable Sariputta suddenly starts, you know, he feels inspired to uh, express, uh, give an exposition on what he heard being said. And he would say, Bhante, uh, from what you have said, this is how I understand it. Sariputta. And he would list, and he would open it up, unfold it, unwrap it. And suddenly, those few verses that Lord Buddha might have said to the Deva, which he repeated now to the bhikkhus, become several pages long of deep, deep Dhamma. And usually, sooner or later, they have to involve the six sense doors. Because that's the key. Those sixes. And they're very closely related with the feelings. Don't forget that. So they're all related. The thing about the Dhamma is whichever end you pick, you touch, it's all connected. I've never come across a single sutta somewhere where you touch that teaching, pluck it, get it, a sentence, and see that it completely is isolated from the rest of the sutta, if it is Dhamma. There might be a few that you will see, and it just doesn't, you know that this doesn't belong. There's something wrong. Somebody added this later on. And yeah, they did. Compliments of the Visuddhi Magga people, Abhidhamma people, Heri people. But the rest, and those are very few, they stick out. Because whatever is true Dhamma, there's always a precedent somewhere. You always can find it, either in the Vinaya text or in the Sutta text, usually in both. And that's why Lord Buddha always encouraged us to use the references he talks about. References. References as when someone comes to you and says this, he says, don't accept it nor deny it. Go and check both the Dhamma and the Vinaya, he says. Again and again. If they say something that is actually true Dhamma, again, don't accept it. Don't reject it. Go check the Dhamma and Vinaya. Dhamma as in the suttas. He knew he wasn't going to live, obviously. That's why he never cared for anyone to come and worship him. Accept him as, oh, yes, our guru, our guru, yes, yes, we will worship you and make amulets and make pictures of you, hang it, this and that. He said, he who sees the Dhamma sees me. He who sees me sees the Dhamma. End of the story. But human beings, we like the fake fruits. We display them. We call the peach peach. It's not a peach. It's an experiencing ing, present continuous. You can't even talk about it in the future, later. Because why? The tasting happened at that moment and it's gone. Bahya, when seeing, just see. Remember? That's the Dhamma for you. Simple. But it requires your vigorous effort. So, uh, Udiani, I lost you there. Are you okay? Uh, it's okay. All right. Uh, uh, are there any questions? Or if there aren't, you can just uh, close for me. Uh, no. No, no questions this time. Surprisingly. 
Yeah. 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 So, Vante, I will invite you. Do you want to share anything no, more? No, please, go ahead. Okay. So I will invite Bhante to do the Anamodana to the Devas and the Departed. Akasatha Chagunatha Deva Naga Mahitika Punyantang Anamoditva Chiranga Kantu Loga Sasanam Akasatha Chagunatha Deva Naga Mahitika Punyan tangan moditva chirang rakhan tu de sana. Akasa tachabumata deva laga mahitika. Punyan tangan moditva chirang rakhan tu mamparanti. Sadu sadu sadu. Uh, so today we have come to an end of today's session. So, uh, and I would like to thank on behalf of Buddhist Mahavihara and the committee uh, and the management for Bhante Chandra for joining us this evening to share the Dhamma. And uh, I would also like to thank today's sponsors. Uh, I hope they got the chance to join this session. And uh, also thank everyone that uh, were listening in both physically and through Facebook. And uh, once again, I would like to share with you all that Bante will be moving to Europe. And as I mentioned earlier, Bante can be reached through his uh, Gmail and you can make any donation to Bante through the PayPal account below. So thank you, Sukihotu. Sukihotu.